Hello everyone, today I'm visiting Corey from Aquarium Co-op. Howdy. And we're going to talk about live bears, so stay tuned. Alright, so I'm here with Corey. We're looking at guppies right now. And one of the most common questions on my live stream is about live bears. And since that's not one of my strong suits, I figure I'd come down here and maybe we can learn together. They're so, my favorite, so... Yeah, so I know that guppies are your favorite and why they're your favorite, but tell the audience, why are guppies your favorite? So guppies are my favorite because you can start with like just a pair of like normal fancy guppies that are kind of assorted and fill up a tank with a ton of color and you get babies all the time, kind of like we've got going on here. They're a relatively easy fish if you meet the basic care requirements in like half of the United States or half the world. Their water will be amazing for it. And then the other half will have to do some work. Like my water is terrible for it. Um, but in general, they're not aggressive. They can go with a lot of other fish. They provide a lot of color. They don't get very big. Most people can keep a guppy. And uh, I love it just because they have babies all the time. And I kind of like being like the, the spokesman for guppies. Because a lot of people don't like to admit they love guppies because they think it's uncool because they're such a common fish where I have no problem saying I love them because I think they're they actually are amazing. So. so they talk about the water. What kind of water do they need? So in general, most live bears are going to want water that has a little bit higher pH. I would say bare minimum at least 7.0, but more like 7.2 to 7.8. Anywhere in that range they'd really love. And in fact, even higher, they'll do OK. Uh, and then hardness, so that's how much calcium, magnesium is in the water. Ideally, at least 150 parts per million, maybe even harder. Like, I'm not sure they ever don't like harder water, um, but you don't have to get it that hard. Like, mine is probably barely at 150, and I'm at about 7.2 pH, and that's because I run crushed coral in all of my tanks to help me, because I am way, way, way below that out of my tap water, so. Now, is it best to start off with a pair or a trio, or what do you think? So with guppies, I like to start out with a trio, and that's why I have a, I have a boy and two girls here. Um, I've started with pairs, and I have pairs of stuff. It just It's a little bit harder on the female, because the boy wants to breed with the girl all the time, and she can kind of get worn out, especially as she gets closer to giving birth. And so a trio or more, like even three females to a male, is even better, um, but a, a, at least a pair for sure, and more females the merrier. Now would you say that's kind of the general rule for all live bearers? Yeah, so if I'm selling live bears at my store and stuff, usually I'd say you want two females for every male of basically every live bearing species. And I'm sure if I thought long and hard enough, I can think of some that break that rule. Like for instance, the one I thought of was the pike live bear, Bellasonics. The females get larger and they typically eat their male counterparts. So the more <laughs> females you have, the worse that would be. But almost any other one, all the basic ones you're normally gonna run into, uh, definitely more females is gonna be a good thing. Okay, so another question is how do we sex guppies? Yeah, so it can be really easy. Uh, what you're going to read about online and what a lot of people will think is you do it by color. So in general, males are really colorful and then females aren't as colorful. Well, these guppies, which I call the best guppies in the world, uh, the females, in my opinion, look better than the males. Like these are both girls here, these big ones. And then the male, which is right up here, up top at the moment, is the boy. But when it comes down to actually sexing most live bears, and I'm going to say most because there are live bears that don't sex out this way, uh, the females, kind of on the bottom of the fish near their anus, they will have an anal fin, which you know males do as well, and it's going to be in a big like triangle form. So it's going to form a big triangle, and you can see that on these females that you know they got their little you know pectoral fins basically or their ventral fins. And then they've got that anal fin that's a triangle. On these fish, they happen to be yellow. Well, on the male, they're going to have their breeding appendage, which is called a gonopodium. And it's going to look more like a stick. Not a, not a V, but more like a stick. And so, of course, he's right up here on the top. Let's see if I can get him to come down a little bit. Where there would have been that oh, yeah. triangle, it's a little skinny stick. And they use that to... Uh, fertilize a female that you know kind of like humans and dogs and other live bears we know that's how reproduction works 
Same way with guppies, they can you know move it to impregnate a female. And uh, so then it gets a little bit difficult because the babies themselves, they don't necessarily take on a sex until they're old enough to. So you look at a lot of the babies, you're going, well, a lot of times I'll get an email or something like that, like, all my babies came out girls. Like, well, they're just not, they haven't matured yet, so you can tell who are boy and girl yet. Um, so you're always looking for that anal fin. And that's how you do uh, guppies, mollies, platies, sword tails, like all those common ones. But then there's some other ones that don't have that to it. And uh, they've got, they still have differences, but they're unique to the fish. And, uh, you know, kind of another thing about most live bears, I'd say, the gestation period is about 30, 32 days. So that means boy and girl get together, and then roughly a month later, we're gonna get some babies coming out. Now, if you don't get any babies, a lot of times what's happening is maybe your filter is sucking them in, maybe there's other fish eating them, that type of thing. But really, pretty much like clockwork, every 30 days or so, more babies are coming out. And when it comes to live bears, they can actually store, you know, what do you wanna call it? you know, milk, semen, sperm, basically from the male. For the, Once they've been fertilized from a male, they can give birth for up to two years, their entire lifespan of kind of that two to three years. Wow. And they only got to be with a male once. And so it can be very difficult to make your own strains and things like that. And that's why, you know, a pure strain like this, if one other fish was to get in there, it's going to contaminate it from, from then on. That being said, it has been proven by science that, let's say that did happen, the current male bred with the female will still give the majority of the genes. So it's, it's not going to be pure, but let's say you can get 60 or 70 percent the way you want it, and there's still those contaminant, uh, you know, milt or uh, fertilization from other um, the other males. So that's kind of you know some basics. And that kind of goes for all of those live bearers too. And uh, I think guppies are probably the most common live bear. Yeah. Probably by far. Yep, I would say they're the most common, um, with probably platies being second. Yeah. Well, let's take a look at a different one. Let's move on to the endlers. Okay. Which are over here. Yeah, so I've got a couple of types of endlers in these tanks. So up here we've got tiger endlers, and they get this tiger pattern. And obviously they're live bearers, so they're giving birth to live fry. And you can see some of the newest hatched ones at the surface there, and some larger ones throughout here. And they're basically, you know, giving birth, they're hiding in the weeds until food arrives, they'll come out. And you see here is a really small baby. Um, but if I keep them well fed, they're not gonna eat them too much. And uh, so that's the tiger endler. And then down below here, a lot of algae is kind of my natural tank, so there's no filter in here, but these are the blue star endlers, so they got a lot of blue to them. And in general, with endlers, males are smaller and the females are larger. And uh, endlers are one of the few live bears that can go below seven. And so I, I've kept these down as, as low as like six, eight, and they can handle lower hardness. I don't know why they do better. Not, it's not that they do better, but they can tolerate much better. I don't know why, but in general, if you have that problem, endlers are a great like beginner at getting into live bear uh, fish. And they come in a few different varieties now. And most of them, like the tiger endler up above, they've been crossed with a guppy to actually make that. So this this was an accident, you know, probably about 10, 12 years ago now, where we had a tequila sunrise guppy, which is kind of just a, a yellowish bodied fish with, um, with some orange on it. And that hopped down into a tank that had endlers, and this, I didn't start this, but this is how the story goes, and it made a fish similar to this, and then they bred some cobra into it, and that's what made it the tiger endler. And so that's why tiger endlers will get a little bit larger than normal traditional endlers. And I don't think I have any traditional endlers here. I only have kind of variants in my, my fish room. So that leads me to another question about what you are talking about earlier as far as the fry. Mm -hmm. it will endlers as far, and guppies for that matter eat the fry? Yeah, so every fish will pretty much eat its own fry. It just depends on how hungry it is and how much hiding places there are. So the more hiding places you have, the less they're going to be able to find their fry. And the more you feed, the less they're going to want to eat their fry. So it's kind of just a, a balancing act of if they're crazy hungry, they're going to eat those fry. If they're full, well, I'm kind of lazy to chase that fry down. And uh, especially the more they can hide out, you can see some hide way in the back. and. Uh, you know, they, they really want food particles to land there, and it's kind of one of those things, the fry can get into there, but the, the big females and stuff, they can't because the nooks and crannies are too small. 
And so, yeah. So a lot of people ask, what's the difference between a guppy and an endler, besides the obvious visual? So basically, they were discovered at different points. Uh, if you were to look at a wild guppy and a wild endler, there's actually not that much of a difference. And I think that's where it stems from. But if you look at um, you know, today's guppies, a fancy guppy and an endler, usually it's going to be a lot of body size is going to be the difference. And then uh, an endler, much more muted color in general than a guppy. And uh, just discovered by different people, come from different waterways. And uh, there's, there's other types of guppies, quote unquote, Pocilia, Picta, for instance. There's a few other oddballs in there, but you, you so rarely see them in the hobby that um, that's why people just, they see endlers, they see guppies, but they don't see those other rare ones, and the other rare ones are pretty hard to keep alive and keep going, so. Uh, but yeah, there's not that much difference. Honestly, like, you know, I wouldn't chastise anyone for thinking they had guppies or endlers. Like, they're, they're close enough, honestly. All right, so here we have one of the, probably the second most common. Uh, these are teacup platies. Yeah, so platies in general, I think, are the second most common. Teacup platies are actually pretty rare, um, but they get that name from being like a balloon molly. Basically, they're a short-bodied fish, and that was a genetic defect that was isolated because people go, wow, that's cute looking. And some, some people love it, some people hate it, you know, uh, but I just thought they they really are nice because they show like a pregnant female really looks pregnant, and of course they're all hiding now that I'm standing like right in the face. Um, but we're keeping them with shrimp in here, and we keep them well fed. We're using these very big pellets, and they can kind of eat them like we would eat an apple or something like that. And it allows them to raise up babies. You can see different sizes in here, and uh, let's see if I can get. Yeah, they're all in the back corner. But you can see that top big one is a female, and that one that's trying to breed with it right now is a male, kind of more intense color. And we can look at their fins and realize that uh, the one in the front's got that gonopodium, that stick, and the one in the back's got that V-shaped fin. And of course, now they've dropped behind the sponge, but they've all raised all these babies out. And I had another colony going for a while, but then I, there was a cichlid in there I didn't know about that finished them off for me, unfortunately. Uh, so we'll be rebuilding this colony, but uh, we've also got some other platies I can show you for a different variation. These are just the teacups, and we'll take a look at some of the variatus platies next. All right, so here are the variatus platys. Uh, I think this is the high fin, right? Yeah, so these are variatus platys. They're technically different than normal platys, subtly different. They can handle a little bit cooler temperatures. Uh, these are the high fin gene. And, uh, you know, pardon the allergy in here, but this is kind of a tank that is a holding tank. Usually I keep these fish outside. And, uh, but you can see like this, this male right here has got a very long dorsal fin that kind of flops over. So it's got that really uh, big high fin gene. And then you see some of the other ones that don't have that nearly as pronounced. And uh, the females kind of get this huge triangle on top. But, you know, this is a fish that gets about three and a half, four inches, really colorful, looks amazing under sunlight. Uh, I've kept them as cold as about 55 before I brought them in over the oh, summer. Wow. So they, you know, the very oddest platy can just go a lot colder than your average platy. Uh, you know, we've got babies going on in here, and you can see them just kind of all around throughout that algae. And algae is one of their first diets. Now, mollies like algae a lot more than platies, but platies, the babies and stuff, they'll go on in the algae. So it's kind of important to have some algae around, and they're going to pick at it all day long. And uh, real peaceful fish, though. So guppies are really peaceful, these platies are really peaceful, and some of the other ones like the mollies and, and sword tails, uh, I find them to be a decent, like a next step up of aggression. They're not quite as uh, low key as some of these guys. And uh, you know, obviously there's some very aggressive live bears as well, but just in the, the hierarchy of aggressiveness. And the good thing about basically all live bears, almost all, is they're all plant friendly, which is nice and uh, just easy to take care of and they can handle a wide range of temperatures and uh, they'll eat almost anything you throw at them and uh, yeah so one of my th this very ass platy in particular is one of my probably top five fish ever like not even just like oh i like guppies I like platies just like if i had to pick exact strains and everything this particular fish i really love and the, the where i found it and where i fell in love with it you can just walk into it like a like a pet smart and pick them up for two or three dollars a piece. Wow. And uh, you know, they don't always have them, but when they do, they're real cheap and they're pretty common there. And I just think it's like, 
one of the purest forms of my joy is like it's not an expensive fish no one's impressed like oh you finally found them because anyone can get them but when you do see them and they're eating bugs and they're doing their thing outside they are just really really good looking so they can handle the lower temperature is ph mm -hmm. still yeah so ph is still important with uh with platies still you basically still want to be above seven where when we're talking about the endlers they can go a little bit below seven um, but yeah, besides endlers, everything else, pH and hardness needs to be up there. You're going to run into some problems. Like in this aquarium, I don't have crushed coral, but this is all aragonite, which also provides minerals and raises that pH for me. Um, which is probably why they're doing well with the uh, Lake Tanganyikans. Right, yep, because they're both peaceful species, and uh, you know, I kind of needed to put them somewhere so they're just in here, and you know, it's kind of a, a temporary situation, not the long term scenario, but. Um, you know, once I get on top of this tank, really, these guys are going to go outside is what's going to happen next. We're just rolling into summer, and then when they come back in, then I'll have a more permanent setup for them. All right, well, let's check out some mollies. Yeah. All right, so here we have the Liberty Molly. This is a Liberty Molly. This is a pretty rare Molly. doesn't have a lot of flashy color, but this is a live bear like you'd see it out in the wild. So it looked just like this. They really only have a little bit of color on their dorsal fin, which is pretty nice. They're a pretty slender, slimline fish. So this kind of a live bear does really well with some of the, the cichlids and things like that. They can escape and they provide good food. And uh, But that also means they're really good at chasing down their own fry because they're not dragging any big fins or anything like that. And you really gotta feed them really heavy to get fry out of them. And uh, they, so the other cool thing is these are true freshwater. They're not a brackish water molly or anything like that. So they just need hard water and decent pH, but they don't have to have salt. They do really well for me. And uh, they're not a great seller like at a pet store or anything like that, but if you're a true live bear nerd like myself, you'll enjoy them. And they're just a nice splash of color. They're good algae eaters. Like there's, there's java moss in here, but there's not like a speck of algae in the place because they're, with mollies, their teeth are right, right up on their lips and it's made for pulling algae right off of rocks and glass and that type of stuff. So uh, just a real nice subtle fish. And uh, I think they pair well with most other like rainbow fish and things like that. Now you said aggression level, they're kind of on that next tier with sword tails. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. I don't think you have any sword tails here, do you? I don't. I don't. Not right now. I, I kind of, I went through a real heavy sword tail phase and at the moment I just don't have any. So are there any other similarities between these and sword tails? Uh, nope. So yeah, between mollies and sword tails, no. But platies and sword tails can cross. So they can actually, that's, sword tails in the wild don't have any color basically. I mean, they have a, a tiny bit of color, but that's where we get the color. So when you see a red sword tail in a store, in a, in a store that we took, wait, when I say we, like the industry or whatever, they took a red platy and a sword tail that was kind of colorless, breathe them together, and you start getting red sword tails. And so almost everything I've seen in a pet store has been crossed. Um, things like xiphosphorus health, health, is it health ride? Hellari. I was thinking of a plant there. Uh, xiphosphorus hellari, alvarezi. Um, those are probably the two main ones you're gonna be able to find in a store that are wild coloration. But most people just go, oh, they're like a they're like a sword tail, but it doesn't look as good. So, you know, only the purists really want those. Everyone kind of wants that color. And then with mollies, mollies can cross with guppies. Now, it's not a very likely cross, and when you do cross them, they come out and they're called either muppies or gollies, uh, but they're all sterile. So once you make one, and they look pretty weird, you know, you can get this molly with this like crazy guppy tail, but they can't breed. And so they're not sustainable. And every once in a while there's people like, oh, I'm really looking for them. The problem is you're buying a fish that's gonna die in two years that you just can't breed. And even with like artificial insemination and stuff like that, like science isn't able to pull it off even at this point. So, um, but yeah, so if we think about it, uh, guppies and mollies can cross, platies and sword tails can cross. And then there's some other live bearers more of the wild types that can cross and stuff like that. But those are, if you're really keeping those, usually you're not keeping them together anyway. And I don't even know all those ones that can cross off the top of my head. Like all the goodies, for instance, they'd all be able, no, maybe not all of them, but most of them would be able to cross. And so, yeah. All right, well, speaking of goodies, let's go check out my favorite goodie. All right, so here we have them, my favorite goodie, the trout goodie. Mm -hmm. A goodie I hope to get from you someday. They're very slow breeders, so, 
This is not quite what it would look like in the wild. It's a little bit enhanced. The person I got it from, which was Greg uh, at selectaquatics.com, he's been breeding them to intensify the yellow a bit on the males. And uh, so they're a nice looking fish. They get about four inches. They're a little bit more aggressive than a guppy, for instance. Uh, they will work on some hair allergies, but the big difference with these guys is they don't have big broods. So like a big brood would be like six or seven. Wow. They also don't want to go really hot. They like cooler temperatures. These guys can handle about that 78 to 80, but a lot of the goody eids like can't go above 74. They just absolutely fall apart. They still want the hard water. They still want uh, the higher pH. Um, and with goody eids, they're different when you, if you're trying to sex them at a store or something like that, their anal fins, both of them look very similar. And in fact, basically, I can only use my hands to describe it because it's really hard to capture on camera, but the female will kind of look like a fist. And so it's just kind of a rounded fin. And then the male is that same rounded fin, except it's got an extra little bump. So, you, you know, before it was like this, and then it would be like this. So it kind of comes down, there's this little extra bump and that, it's actually, there's a hook on there and that it hooks into the female to inseminate them that way. And goodyids are different in the fact that, the reason why they only have very few fry is they come out much bigger. So people are shocked when they come out. They go, wow, that must've been born like a month ago. No, it just came out, they're much bigger, but they actually have umbilical cords attached. So they've been feeding off the parents inside wow. of them for a long time. And they don't have babies every 30 days. They have babies every, basically 60 to 90 days. And so they spend a lot more time just growing inside that fish. And you can see in here, well, if they gotta grow up in there, five or six fish coming out that big, no wonder they can't have something like a guppy or something like that where it's 100 or 200 or 300, depending on the species. And so they're just a real fun fish. Uh, I wanna play with them outside. They're not common at all, um, but they would do great with rainbow fish and just other you know, things that can kind of swim fast. I wouldn't put them with guppies or any long finned fish, um, but great fun oddball live bear that, you know, what's great about this live bear is while it's different, most people that come into the fish room go, wow, what is this fish? This thing looks pretty nice. And it gets named the trout goodyad because it kind of looks like a trout. And obviously plant safe, which is nice. And uh, overall, just kind of a, a unique thing to keep around that you'll never kind of wake, make way too many of. They'll never be in mass production where you're gonna find them at stores and so you kind of, kind of always have this rare fish on your hands. Now, I might be thinking of a different fish, but did you used to or do you still keep them with Murphy? Did you used to have them in that tank? I did, yeah. So I had them with, uh, with Hank for a while. Hank, that's that was my previous puffer. And uh, yeah, they did, they did well. And I think the way to make a lot of these is actually raise them in kind of a pond scenario. I'm hoping to play with that outside. And goodyids are one of the live bears that can go cooler. And so I'm hoping I can merge the two outside. I've keep my ponds a little bit warmer throughout the winter and keep one that can actually thrive in those lower temperatures and see if I can't uh, have some looks really nice. Cause I think, I just know from doing fish outside that color intensifies so much more when they're actually eating bugs and they've got actual sunlight hitting them. And I think these guys might look really good. Sun rays coming into the pond, catch that yellow from the side and whew, take my breath away. All right, so there you go, goodyids, trout goodyids specifically. Uh, any other live bears in here? Uh, yeah, I've got maybe one or two left down here in this little algae farm. I've got Heteriandrophomosa. This is the smallest live bear in the world. And so like this male right here, that's full grown. Like so, like one inch is full grown on a male. The females get a little bit larger. Yeah, I can't even focus on them. Yeah, they're really small. So the females, like that one in the back probably, uh, they get maybe an inch and a half, maybe. And what's kind of cool about them is because they're so small, they can't have a batch of fry either, right? So what they do is they're almost a conveyor belt. So like every three or four days, another baby comes out and it's just kind of, that's how the females work. And so you get a lot of stages of fry going on in here. And uh, they're not, they're not like a super pretty fish. They're a great nano tank fish. And what makes them cool is they're native to the United States. So it's one of the few natives that we can actually keep that have some cool properties to it. And uh, you know, I just breed them because I like them. There's also a gold form, which I don't have currently. And uh, they're, they're super duper peaceful. Great, great to put with shrimp. And uh, look, I think they have a lot of personality. If you had like a, like a two and a half or a five gallon on a desk somewhere, 
I think they would be a great candidate. Yeah, I actually kept these for about a year and a half and then just kind of got away from them. But I still have a few left in my 37 gallon. They're, they're great in a small tank. Like, you, you gotta have them somewhere where you couldn't have other stuff because they usually just lose the war of cool stuff. Like, oh man, I gotta put something cool in a tank. Oh, I'll put them in here. And then eventually they get out competed for food and then you go, what do you mean I don't have any more of those left? All right, there you have it, YouTube. Live Bear 101. I hope you learned something and found it enjoyable. Definitely check out Corey at Aquarium Co-op. Don't forget to subscribe to Corey, subscribe to me, and secondly, smash that notification bell. Let's do it. <laughs> All right, guys and gals, I hope you had fun, and I'll see you next time.